We're going to go for about three hours, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give you an overview of how we run the business. The great thing about this uh, event is that you get a lot of different perspectives on wholesaling. Because most events you go to, they cover the full gamut from, from taxes to asset protection. You know, they'll touch on wholesaling. You might get an hour and a half, but you really get a different perspective of how Mike runs the business, of how Preston runs the business, of how I run the business. And you'll get a and we all run it differently. You know, everyone has a different opinion on what's the most efficient way to do business. And, and that's what I want you to realize is there's different business models that work for different people. You know, markets are different. People, you know, people tell you it works in every market. Well, it does work in every market. It just works differently. And you have to look at it. Because I coach a lot of people out in California that are doing business in San Francisco. Guess what? You wholesale differently in San Francisco than you do in Ohio. Anybody from Ohio? All right. What's the average property value in, in uh, your hometown? Single family, three bedroom, two bath house. 120 grand. 120 grand. And in San Francisco, that may get you a dog house. You know, so you just do things differently. And so it's great to get everyone's opinion and, and chime in on the way they do business. Some people, you know, they, they just fax out offers and this is their, their, their game plan for acquiring property. Some people don't think you have to go meet with a seller. And everyone has a different way that they go about the business. And what you have to find out is what's going to work for you. What's going to work for you? And, and the great thing is you get a lot of different perspectives on wholesaling and it really gives you the knowledge that you need. I mean, what you need is three days on one topic. You know, we do events, we put on events, we have a rehabbing event we put on, and it's just rehabbing, and that's what you need, you need that. So, you know, you have to give it, I have a lot of respect for Mike and what he's done here. So, what am I gonna cover with you today? What I really wanna focus on is business growth. And that's really what we're going to talk about. We're going to focus on, I'm going to give you an outlook of the different areas of the business and how we look at it, how we market for sellers. You know, I'm big into marketing for sellers and buyers. I think that's the one area I can really help you and give you a different perspective. Change the way you think about marketing because marketing is the key to the business. What's the key to the business? I just want to make that clear. It is the key to the business. If you want to see your income grow, you'll see the number of leads that you get from sellers grow every single month. If you want to see and make your life easy, you build your buyer's list. Write this down. Your most valuable asset of your business is your buyer's list, by far. Why do you think Mike Collins started a rehab list? So he could have ready, willing, and able buyers that were rehabbers to buy his wholesale deals. I'm assuming that's why he started it. Maybe he told you differently. But in my perspective, in my mind, that's why he started rehablist.com. It is because he wanted a big buyer's list. You'll realize it gets easier and easier the more buyers you funnel onto that list. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on that aspect of the business because I realize that's a big weakness for most investors is their buyer's list. So that's what we're going to go through is th how to grow your business. And it's really, it's about automating, write this down, it's about automating business processes. Everything is a business process. And I'm going to give you a quick example. When you're looking at a deal, how you gather the information, how you evaluate the deal, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the information and evaluate it as quickly as possible and figure out what's good and what's not good. To figure out what's a good deal and what's a waste of your time. Because the more time you waste, the less money you make. We don't get paid per hour, unfortunately. You know, we are not employees. You only get paid on the deals you convert. So the more you can automate every single area of the business, the more money you will make. The more money you'll make. The more automation. So you should think about what you do on a daily basis. Everything that you do. Are you wasting time? Are you cleaning your house on Sundays? Who's cleaning their house on Sundays? Be honest with me. Right? Waste of time. You can have someone at $8 an hour do that. Now all of a sudden you have three, four additional hours a week to produce income. Because our whole life we can spend doing these monotonous things, but you have to realize you've got to use your time, and your time is very, very valuable. So that's what we're going to focus on, is how to grow the business from that aspect. I'm going to focus a lot on marketing. I'm also going to get into wholesaling and our perspective on it. But I realize marketing is the genesis. And so I always ask the question, how should you invest in today's market? Who's got an idea? Just throw it out there. Direct mail. Direct mail. Okay, that's an idea. Okay, how should you invest? Guess what? The, the genesis, I always say, this is where we start. If you want to see a business grow, does anybody else have a business besides being a full-time real estate investor? Another completely unrelated business. Yeah. 
What's your business? Website. Website, right? So if you don't have marketing to go out to attract people to the website, do you have a business? No. 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 Who's got another business? What's your business, sir? I, uh, I run a guitar studio. Guitar studio. So if you don't have interest in, you sell guitars or you no, sell no, time? I, I, I instruct. You instruct. Okay, so if you don't have clients that want to learn how to play the guitar and you don't have some sort of marketing to attract them, do you have a business? No. I would imagine you don't. Most of your business is probably built on referrals, I would assume, after a certain point. But right. guess what? That's marketing. You know, how you interact with clients, how you treat them, how, how many people they refer, that's all a form of marketing. And so when it comes to running a business, how effective and efficient your business is, is dependent on your marketing. And so I always tell people, a real estate investor, because this is a mistake that I made. I used to go out my first year in the business, I got into buying rental properties. I, I found myself at a three-day tax savings seminar. Now, is learning about taxes important, yes or no? Yeah, it's obviously important, very important. Once you start making money, it's important. But at that time point, I had a couple rental properties that were over leveraged that I had bought wrong. I had a restaurant that was suffering. And here I am studying for three days of time that I didn't have about how to save money on taxes. Right? This doesn't really make sense when I boil down to it. At the end of the seminar, I said, I've learned a lot, but I, I don't have enough money to apply the concepts that I've learned. I said, I've got to go out there and produce income. What produces income is marketing. And how effective your marketing is, how efficient your marketing is, and how consistent your marketing is determines your success. I don't care how, how many strategies you know about how to structure deals from double closings to assignments. It doesn't matter if you don't have good quality leads coming in every single month from sellers and buyers. That's why it's a foundation. Now, in today's market, I think the best way to get started is wholesaling. I think it is the most logical place to get started when you're new in any market. The market's going up. Guess what? It has the least amount of risk, and you make more money per hour. And I compare it because these are real. This is our focus. This is what we do. This year, about 60% of the past, uh, the past year, 60% of the deals we did were wholesale deals. The other 40 rehab deals. But I look at these two aspects, you know, this is flipping properties. That's what we do. It's flipping properties two different ways. That's our business. You know, that's where we specialize. We have, we have a lot of rental portfolio too, but that is not where we make our money. We make our, the majority of our money. And I think this is the most logical way to get into the market. You build up your cash cushion, and then you start acquiring rental properties. I see a huge mistake a lot of people make early on is they start acquiring rentals too early. Ask me how I know how, because this is a mistake that I made. And I literally looked at our cash flow and I looked at what I had in the bank and I looked and if, if we had three or four tenants that left at that time, we, we were upside down completely. And so it was, I think what you do is you build up that cash and then you acquire those bigger buildings. I think if you have, how many of you have smaller rental units, like four units or less, right? Duplexes, single families. We have a lot, but I think that's a crazy way to invest because you're running around town to a three to four unit properties, two units. I think you're better off flipping, wholesaling properties, and then going out there and buying one 15 unit building, and then upgrading to a 30 unit. And if you want to hold property, those are the properties you want to get. Because that's where it's worth your time. You know, we had a lot of rental properties. We were running around like crazy. At the end of the week, we realized we didn't have a lot of time to flip properties because we were too busy managing all the different tenants that we had, you know, in our 12 properties all around town. And it was crazy. And I thought if we had one building, we probably have an extra 20, 30 hours every single month that we could invest in time into flipping properties. And I said, we got to consolidate. So we sold some things off and we said, we're going, we're just going to flip. And we changed our niche and that's when our business took off. And so that's what I feel the best way to invest is for every rental property you're going to acquire, you got to flip a certain amount of deals to have that cushion because there's risk in holding properties. If the market comes down 10% here in Tampa, how much has the value of your equity gone down? You know, 10%. If you own a property, 200,000, you lost 20 grand. You have to be able to ride the storms. You can't ride the storms holding long-term assets unless you have a cash cushion. And so, very simple terminology, but I think, you know, it needs to be ingrained. And so, why, why do I feel it's the best for today's market? Here, it's very simple. Profits are immediate. You compare it to rehabbing. How many of you do rehabs as well? Does anybody do a lot of rehabbing? I compare it to rehabbing, and I look at it, and your average rehab deal is going to take, you know, six to seven months to get cashed out. No doubt. Because a lot of times the average days on markets, you know, 120 days, four months. You buy the property, you fix it up, two months. You may not get a check for seven months. 
Wholesaling, that's a completely different ball game. That's why I tell every new person, how many of you are new and I would say, haven't bought more than two properties in the last year or so? How many of you are new that I could call new investors? See, best advice you can get, wholesale out, two, to, two out of three deals should be wholesale deals, at least. You know, and that's the ratio you should go by, at least two out of three deals, Every three deals that come in, try to wholesale too. Minimal risk, obviously, these are simple concepts. The market risk, you're not affected by the market risk because you're, most of the time you're buying and selling the property the same day or you're selling it, uh, you know, a month later or a week later, you know, all depending on how fast you turn that property. Capital and credit, that's the reason why you get involved because you're tying these properties up with very small deposits. Very small deposits. Most of the sellers don't even know that there needs to be a deposit. I hate to say it, but it's true. I mean, with sellers, they don't even know that there needs to be a deposit to make this a contract. And you could put $1 on there, you could put $1,000, they wouldn't mean anything to them. They look at the ultimate price, right? But there's no other business where you know your outcome. You know your outcome. You know, unless it's a short sale deal that you're closing on, a lot of the wholesale deals, we it's just equity. All we're doing is we're negotiating the equity, putting the property under contract, have that property under contract, give ourselves 40 days to close, we find a buyer, we close it out in 30. Our risk is absolutely minimal. And that's why it's the best niche. When you get into rehab, when you get into these other aspects, you have more risk. And so it's just a logical way. But here's the real reason why we have wholesaling as the number one niche. Is that I don't think you can find another niche where you will make more money per hour. More money per hour, if you actually calculate it, because I look and we do a lot of rehab deals and I look at how much time we commit. And we make bigger profits off these rehab deals because we're adding value. We may make 45,000, 50,000 on a deal. But then you look at how many hours you spent to do that project. And a business is a function of time. You do have to look at how much time you're spending. And I'll say, okay, we spent 50 hours to complete this project from, from the time we acquired it to the time we structured the deal to the time we managed the project. 50 hours into this deal, we made 50 grand. How much is that per hour? How much? Ten, it's not 10. 50,000, we spent 50 hours. $1,000 per hour, right? Pretty good, pretty good paying job, if you ask me. But then you look at a wholesale deal where you make 20 grand and you spend five to six hours putting the deal together, seven hours. And you compare it, there's, there's no comparison. There is no comparison about the money per hour. And so that's why, when you look at investing, that's all, you, that's all I care about. If you show me another investment, I love real estate, I have a great passion for it, but if you show me another investment where we can, you can make more money per hour, I'm gonna be interested. I haven't found one yet. I haven't found a niche yet where you make more money per hour. And then, when you transition it to somebody else's hours, that's when the business really becomes fun. And I'll show you, when we started out, I know you wear every hat in the business. And so what I want to show you is how some of the systems that we have can save you time. Because if I can save you time, can I make you money, yes or no? Yeah. It's a tremendous value. When you get that time back in your life, you can do a lot of things. You can start looking into multiple streams of income when you have a system that's running your wholesale business. If you're chaotic, if you have no system, you're never going to get into a second stream of income. You're never going to get into making money on the internet unless you've sy created systems for one business and one business only. So that's why I always tell people, start out, don't get distracted with a, a multi-level marketing opportunity. Don't get distracted. Just figure out this business, create a system, hire one or two people, and then start looking at other streams of income. Best way to do it. So, what's the best opportunity? What's unique about this market in 2008? Who's got an idea? Pat, I know you're asleep, but what, what, what in your mind is a unique opportunity that's happening for probably the next eight months? Probably more, more motivated sellers on the market than we've seen in the past eight to ten years. Yep. Absolutely. And it's only getting worse for about, the, the foreclosure situation is going to get worse for, I, and this is my prediction, and just what I've studied, the next eight months. It's a unique opportunity. So if you're not getting involved in short sales in some aspect, I think you're crazy. I think if you're not marketing to foreclosures, and foreclosures, just to put it in perspective, is about one-fifth of my, my business. So one out of every five properties we buy are foreclosures. My best deals, the way I look at it, are from probate deals. Because generally there's more equity. You know, a lot of times when the market comes down, a lot of the foreclosure leads you get are going to be leads that you're going to have to negotiate the debt in some way. I hate to say it, but I'm lazy. And I like to just get deals that have equity. And when those equity deals come in, where some of the house is worth 200, they owe 100, and they want 120, you don't have to be that smart to put that deal together. 
And so my thought is, how can I market to find those opportunities as well as foreclosure opportunities? And so I put it in perspective, but it is a unique opportunity. So if you're not, mar how many of you are currently marketing to specifically just foreclosures right now? How many of you are doing foreclosure marketing? Okay. How many of you are not doing any sort of foreclosure marketing right now? Okay, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta start doing it, because it is a unique opportunity. The banks are waking up, in my opinion. And it's really based on, you know, short sales is a function of what, what I like to call the BPO. You know, who comes out to do the BPO? That's the secret behind the short sale. You create a relationship with the BPO agent, makes the business very easy. But I'm not gonna get into to that. You know, short sales is a buying strategy, but it is a unique market opportunity that you have to be aware of. So, here's a question that most people in this room are probably asking. Some people are asking, man, I just want to leave this event and get my first few deals done. Is anybody asking that question in their mind? Anybody? Okay. Then there's other people in this room that are already doing business, right? Have you talked to people in this room that are doing some volume, pretty impressive people, right? Some of the speakers are doing volume, some of the, you know, Mike's still doing a lot of volume, I know that. What people want to know is what does it take to build a business, and that's the key. Because whether you buy one property, you buy a hundred, if you're just looking for your first deal, you need to treat it like a business. It must be treated like a business from the very first deal that you do. And the way to look at it is this. The very first property I buy, maybe it's your personal residence if you're new. Say, I just want to get a discount. I want to buy it at 60 cents on the dollar. What I want you to do is, is when you look at that process, what did it take to get the deal? How did you market? How did you analyze the deal? How you structured the deal? How many times did it almost fall out, of, fall out of contract? How many times did the deal almost blow up when you were flipping it? And then what you do is say, how can I shrink that time and do it over and over again? And that's how I've looked at a business. The very first deal that we flipped took us you know, quite a few hours to put this whole deal together. And I said to my business partner, Paul, I said, first of all, the, the first two deals we, we wholesale, we made 52 grand. And I said, we have to shrink this time. We have to shrink this time. The first rehab deal that we did, I don't have an actual calculation, but it was at least 200 hours of committed time to do this rehab. I said, Paul, we're not going to be in this business very long unless we shrink that time. And now that same project, years later, would probably take us about 15 hours of management, meaning not our time. Somebody we've hired that works a system to do that same deal with 15 hours. That's how you think about the business. Write this down. Business process automation, if you haven't written down. Business process automation. How many of you have read the book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber? Who's read that? Who's heard of that book? Re write that down and read it. If you don't, if you don't, do, if I, if you don't get anything out of this seminar, read that book. It has nothing to do with real estate investing, yet it has everything to do with building a business. And I said, how can I shrink time and do things more efficiently? You know, if you only have 15 hours a month to commit, or 15 hours a week to commit to the business, how many of you have less than 15 hours a week with everything you got going on, your lifestyle, less than 15 hours a week to commit to real estate investing, right? You really have to automate your business. You really, because you, you can't get a lot of deals done with five hours worth of time, so you have to outsource a lot of the things that you do. That's why Tim, you know, Tim Mai talked about virtual assistants, I'm assuming, you know, different ways. What he's teaching you is how to be more efficient with your time so you can get more done. And that's really what the question is. So what does it take to build a business? Well, here's, here's where we're going today. I'm going to go through marketing. I'm going to go through analyzing deals. I'm going to go through negotiating. I'm going to go through teaching in stages as, as if we're doing a deal. So you can see all the different stages. But before we get into that, you have to understand how to build a business. And that's where I teach from a philosophy first. So just bear with me, because we're not going through actual concepts to get a motivated seller right now. What I'm going through is more important, and that is, Building a business. Write this book down. I just listened to this book on tape. I not, guess not on tape, on, on my iPod, but nobody listens to tape. Does anybody listen to tapes anymore? <laughs> uh, there's one guy. There's always one guy that still listens to tapes. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, Jim Collins, Good to Great. Has anybody ever read that book or listened to that book? Excellent. It's called Jim Collins, Good to Great. He also wrote Built to Last. Excellent book. Excellent book. And what he was talking about in that book is, is what does it take to be a good company and go to a great company? He said, and how can you have that long-term sustained result? And so that's what I wanted to start off with. What does it take to be a great investor? Well, to start, when you're new, it takes knowledge. It takes knowledge. Does it not? I'll give you an idea. This is what my office looks like. I, I only think, Pat, you've been to my office. You're the only one. 
So Pat, if you, Pat comes into my war room where we look at all the deals, this is why we're successful. I hate to say it, I am a seminar junkie. And that's what I, I grew up on going to seminars. And every single, and some seminars were better than others. You know, and there's a great concept behind this seminar. Some, but it's still specific to the speakers that come in. Because even if you go to a high level paid event, you know, and there's multiple speakers, there may be one speaker there that teaches you three points of making an extra 150 grand. You better believe it's worth it. You better believe it's worth it. Every seminar I've been to, I've gotten something out of some nugget that I've used. Well, early on, that's what it takes. It takes knowledge. You know, the old cheesy saying, the more you learn, the more you earn. It's true. It's true. I didn't understand that when I was in college. You know, I paid a lot of money to go to school. I went to an Ivy League school, but I didn't realize the value of that education until after I left. And I still kick myself saying, God, I didn't take advantage of all the opportunities that were there. Every opportunity that comes your way, guess what? It starts there. Now, knowledge is useless, though, because a lot of seminars you'll go to and they just give you ideas. Hey, put out a bandit sign. Great, thanks. You know, they gave you an idea, but they didn't give you an actual system. Well, really what it takes to build a, a business is systems. Is systems. You know, my very first deal that we did, we made 52 grand right here. Wholesale deal, we wholesale two homes, we made 52 grand. That's when I realized, wow, there is a value to knowledge. There is a value to what you learn. And you have to organize information. One of the most confusing things, is there a lot of information? Can you go on the internet and pretty much learn everything that you could learn in this seminar? You could if you sorted through the information and you had a way of deciphering and organizing the information. Unfortunately, it's hard to do. Unfortunately, most people don't have the commitment for three days to do that. And so as a result, a seminar is a great place. Well, knowledge, you can acquire that knowledge, but it's useless without a system. And this is really what creates the freedom within your life. And it starts to shrink time, I like to call it. It's having that system. Well, systems are invaluable. You know, the very first seminar, and I always, I always boil it down to this little quick story. The very first seminar that I went to, I invested $3,000. It was worth every penny because at the time, I needed knowledge. And I got that knowledge while I was there. But most of the knowledge that I was given was in the form of ideas. So she was leading the seminar. She told me, put out bandit signs. Now, how many of you put out bandit signs, right? Now there's these internet bandit signs. I've heard there's this guy that has this course on internet. Does anybody know if it's good? Or? <laughs> Where's Mike? He's not even here yet. It's a great course, right? Well, I was taught this. Put out bandit signs. Put out bandit signs. That was great. So then the next... You know, I went there, I took that idea, and I went into action, and I started putting out bandit signs. And for the next week, there I was, and it was 2 a.m., I was standing on the hood of my car, and I'm nailing up this sign, because I, I didn't want to do it during the day. I was way too afraid to do it during the day. <laughs> you get caught during the day. And I thought to myself, damn, what the hell am I doing? It's 2 a.m. in the morning. This isn't the best use of my time, because what I was given is an idea without a system. I wish I could rewind that and she had said, you know what, if you put out signs, here's the system to do it. First of all, you've got to hire someone, then you've got to create a route map for them, then you've got to go out there and you've got to actually do each route one time yourself, you've got to create a rotation schedule, then you've got to create a little training guide. For the, has anybody ever hired a sign guy? Yeah. Are, yeah. Is anybody, are you a sign guy? Yeah, that's, that's number one thing. Yeah. You know, are they that smart? No, no, they're not. So a lot of times you've got to hire and fire them, right? Yep. And so every time I had to hire and fire them early on, I had to train them on how to put a sign. I literally had to go out there and show them how to put up a sign so they wouldn't put it up backwards. And there I was for four hours, and then I had to monitor them. For, it was probably about, I'm not even kidding you, six hours worth of time to train one person who was going to leave in two months. So I said, I've got to create a system to train it. You know what? So I shot a little video of how to put up a sign. I created a little four-page training manual, and then what I did is I told my assistant, Any, anybody who comes in, make sure they read the training manual, and make sure they watch the video, they're out, right? Now we get signs out there consistently, and I don't have anything to do with it, and I love it. Now that's what you need to realize is the difference between a system and an idea. Thank you very much for the idea I got at the seminar. It helped me get my start, but you didn't give me a system behind it. That's how you think about everything that you do, marketing. Training, you know, when, does anybody have employees that they actually hire right now or that have on staff at all? One person, okay. Do you have one, two employees, three employees? Five. Five. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Many of you will be there in two to three months. You will, the first deal, I think the first thing you should do is instead of buying a boat, is you should buy an employee. <laughs> you should, because you reinvest right back into what, and that's the one thing that we've done well, is we've reinvested back into the people. Well, 
Have you had to train and do some of the same trainings over and over again with the same people? Yeah, how to take a call, right? How to take a lead from a seller. You ever done this training before, right? I've done it probably 10 times, and then I sm got smart and said, wait a second, why don't I just record a training? Why don't I just record a training on the phone, going through all the different concepts, and then every person I hire and put it in the business, I can just hit play, you know, and let them, and then I don't have to train them, I still will just have to monitor the training. Right? That's, I know it might be a little advanced concept if, you don't, if you're just still trying to get a deal, but what I want you to do is write this down. I want you to build your business as if you were going to sell it. There's not that many house buying businesses that have been sold on the open market, very few. But what I want you to do, just for your own sake and your own financial freedom, is build every process as if you were going to sell it. How could you stick a monkey into the process and have them still work the business? It's true. If you can build a business, you know, that's how businesses are bought and sold. Is, you know, if I were to take, what, what's your name, first name, Arnie? Arnie. Arnie, that's right. Arnie, if I were to take you out of your house buying business right now, would you continue to get any money? No. No, right? So that business is of no value. Because I can't buy that business without buying you and having you work in the business. So everything that you do, and this is for every business, every stream of income, you say, how can I build this business and have it not be dependent on me? And that's the key. And I know that's a, hard, that's a concept that you grab. So from the, if you've never done a pre-foreclosure marketing campaign, what I want you to do is I want you to say, okay, this is, I'm going to do this campaign one time myself, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about how I could create a system to have somebody else do it, and then I could have a system just to train them on working the system, and then I could step out. Because, uh, you know, just an interesting story. The first year I was in the business, we bought and sold 30 properties. That's a lot your first year. I was working seven days a week. At the end of the year, I sat down with Paul, and we looked at the books, and we had made a lot of money. We had made a lot of mistakes. And I said, I don't want to do this business if we have to do this again. I don't care how much money we make. It's because we had knowledge, we were working, but we had no system. And then as soon as we started to shrink time and create systems, that's when we really created value. Well, what does systems do? Well, here's the problem with most businesses, right? Anybody have a business that looks like this? Anybody? Come on, be honest with me. All right. Everybody's got a business like this. Put your hand up right now. Let me see. All right. So what you do is you market, right? Then the phone call comes in. Who answers the phone? You do. Okay, now you gotta, who's going to pull the comp and look at the deal? You. Okay, who's going to do this? We don't even know what it is, but I bet you're going to do it. Who's going to go raise the money? Who's going to meet with the buyer? Who's going to, right? To take you out of the business that dies. So what you do is you say, okay, th these are advanced concepts. And someone's saying, well, this doesn't apply to me. I haven't even got my first deal. I just got to figure out how to do that. What I want you to do is from that very first deal say, all right, how did this process work? What did I do? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? How can I create a system to do that over and over again? So that's the problem with most businesses. You take the business owner out and you got nothing. So what do we do? Well, here's a quote. The most important asset of any business professional is time. So what you want to do is you want to shrink that time. Well, I'm going to give you an idea. I want to show you. This is a deal that we did October 17th. We made 44 grand on this wholesale deal. And just to give you an evolution of where I want you to go, this is a deal that we wholesale. Is October 17th, was the market strong three months ago? No, it's a down market in Connecticut. It's a down market just like it is here, right? The buyers are just as hard to find. We're still doing these deals. The beauty about this is I've never even seen this property. No idea. Everyone in my office did this deal. Everyone in the office did the deal. And so to give you an idea, that's where you want to go. And you want to go from the first deal. From the very first deal that you do, you want to think, how can I take myself out of this business? That's how wealthy people think. How many of you think that wealthy people think differently than people that are impoverished? Anybody think that? Very true. So what do we do? We create systems. What's a system going to do? It's going to save you time, energy, and money. That's what it's going to do. Now, here's a great program. Write this down. If you do not use this program, I think you're crazy. I will. This is an excellent program to build a business. This is how I built every system is I've created a map. Anybody ever heard of mind mapping or the concept of mind mapping, right? This is how a business is built from little steps. So what this is, is it's on MindJet Mind Manager, I believe is the website. If you, just, if you type in MindJet, you will find this program. It's a software program. I do not work for the company. I'm not a sales rep for the company. It's $175. Just go online, buy it. I think you can go on eBay and even get it a little bit cheaper.
Mindjet. Mindjet Mind Manager. And what it does is, is I've written, this is how I wrote my course material, this is how I wrote and, and planned out my business, is I would break down and I would break it down into steps and it's very visual. So for example, this is a buyer series, right? I was saying, we need to build relationships with buyers because dealing with buyers is different than dealing with sellers, is it not? The timeline is much longer. A seller, when they're motivated, how long does the average good, great deal, I should say great deal last? 24 to 48 hours. If it's a great deal, because a lot of times when a seller finally wakes up and says, I'm ready to go, what do they do? They go to the paper. Maybe they remember the bandit sign. Well, if they see two or three bandit signs of two different numbers, or maybe they got five or six letters. You know, if you're in Tampa, maybe they got 40 letters, right? So they just go right down the gamut. They go right down and say, I'm ready to sell. First one to get me what I need. Well, if you don't answer that phone and you're not the first one out there to analyze that deal, a lot of deals you'll lose. Not every single one. Sometimes a, you know, a great deal comes, away, comes your way, no competition. You know, Sometimes the stars and the moon align. But more often than not, you have to beat your competition to the deal. And so you have to be more efficient. Well, here's buyers, right? So one of the things that we do is, I, is how I sit in my office and I say, okay, we wholesale a lot of properties. Every wholesale buyer that buys a property from me, I want them to make money. Why do I want them to make money? So they'll come back, so they'll refer more business to me, right? You'll be amazed. When somebody makes money on a wholesale deal that you sell them, it is like unbelievable how many referrals they'll send to you. And so I said, we have to facilitate those referrals. And so what I said is, after we sell a property, what I want to do is I want to create an email campaign to those wholesale buyers to build a relationship and to encourage them to send me referrals, right? This is, this is a little different way of thinking because this is, this is how a realtor might think. Oh, I'm going to sell a property and then I'm going to create a relationship so they send me more business. What's the cheapest form of marketing for a realtor? When they're referral, referral. Well, why can't we do it as investors? Even if you only have three properties that you're going to buy and sell this year, is your goal next year to maybe double that volume? Well, guess what? You start. So this is what I started doing. I, you start to plan. Well, day one, I'm going to send it on email. What's it going to say? Day two, day three, day, you know, all the way throughout the year. What's it, what's it going to say? Do I want to know their birthday? So I'm going to send them a little birthday email. Am I going to automate the whole process? You better believe it. Who does all the work? Click. Right? That's what automation does for your business. That's what it truly does. And so this is a great program. You can plan out every area of your life. If you're going on your first date, you can plan out move number one, move number two, move number three, right? All the way down until you close the deal. <laughs> then you print it out, you put it in your pocket, right? Automate, you know, I'll just tell you a funny story. My business partner, Conrad, uh, I have two business partners. My business partner, Conrad, he's a single guy. And uh, when he was, he was engaged, and I always make, it's kind of harsh, we're kind of hard on each other, but the engagement fell out of contract, right? <laughs> and he was back on the market. And I said, Conrad, this is what we're going to do. You know, I, uh, I at the time was dating somebody else, and so I said, what we're going to do is I'm going to build a campaign for you. We're going to go on to Match.com. I'm going to create an autoresponder campaign. I'm going to create a system. What we're going to do is we're going to have a little web form. We're going to ask them some very general questions. And I said, I, I, and this is very stereotypical. So men can be categorized into five different categories, right, of men. And women, maybe 12. They're a little bit more complicated. And so I said, we're going to boil it down and figure out, you know, what type of woman this is and then create a campaign that builds that relationship so that you can work more in the office. And this little autoresponder campaign is going out. Like email number one, I was just thinking about you, baby. I was, I was just thinking maybe we should maybe take a vacation coming up sometime soon. I was just thinking about you. I was, second email, you know, I just read this great poem, right? And we'll build this whole campaign. I said, we'll blast everybody and we'll just narrow it down. Right? So I'm trying to create a system for what he was doing. Well, you do that for every area of your business. No joke. Every area of your business, starting with your marketing. That's where you start. Now, we talked about this yesterday. Action. What are your factors for success? How quickly you implement it? Who's got an idea? Not from me. From somebody else this weekend that they wrote down, and right now it's probably one, two, or three on their priority list. When they go home, they're going to put it into motion. Who's got an idea? Raise your hand. This is, we call this a group share. Don't be shy. Yeah. Who is the person who taught it to you? What did they teach you? And how quickly are you going to put it into motion? I like what 
uh, Tim Mike said about uh, calling other investors and trying to sell their property. Okay, so basically brokering their deals if you have a big buyer's list. Was that what he was teaching? Right. Okay, so he said build your buyer's list, then call all the friends that have signs, then call all the people in the newspaper, and he said call them up and say, hey, I got a list. If you blast it to my list, I'm going to take five grand. Was that the concept? Yes. Pretty, pretty much more or less? So what are you going to do? I already know a couple. Okay, so good. You, want, you like that? Give him a round of applause. Already made phone calls. He didn't wait until next week, because next week you would have put those notes right on your shelf. If you don't start making phone calls now, start putting together a list. That's a great strategy. You know, the best thing you can do is go to your RIA club, find out every person who's doing a lot of deals. Every week, every month, go to the RIA club, because guess what? There's new people there every time. Every sign that you pass by, every newspaper ad, find out who your competitors are. What you should do is you call them once a month. Stay in front of them. Say, hey, what do you got? What do you got? Got any deals that you can't structure? Got any deals you can't fund? Most people are new anyway. Most of the signs you see, most of the things, those aren't experienced investors. Those are new investors that just went to a Carlton Sheets course. <laughs> We're given a couple ideas, and now they're new in the business. Great concept. I like that. I like that. Who's got another one they want to share? No. Oh, now we're all shy. No, that was the same idea. Oh, the same idea? Well, well, the only idea you got was from Tim Mai? Come on. What else? Calculate your check before you buy. Calculate your what? Check. Calculate your check. So count your money before you buy. Give me, give me more in detail. Uh, I don't know that yet. <laughs> was it analyze the deal more? Analyze in, the deal in the beginning. In the beginning. Uh, yep. Uh, Create your exit strategy probably before you buy. Don't just put it under contract and then try to figure out what you're going to do. Right? I, it could be the same concept. Good. How are you going to put it into motion? <coughs> okay. All right. Well, that, that, we'll refine that. We'll refine that and you'll have an actual step that you're going to do. Do you have access to the MLS? Oh, yes. You do. You don't have to go through a realtor to get the MLS. <laughs> are you a realtor? No, I do. I'm still a realtor. But you got their passcodes. You got something? I won't tell anybody. Don't worry. <laughs> Do you have direct access to it? No, nope. no way. Don't do it. Too slow. All right. Here's your first action step. You got to get access to the MLS somehow. If you're going to be looking at deals and at determining your exit strategy up front, cut out not cut out the realtor, but you got to get direct access. MLS is by far the best comp service out there. There are other comp services out there, but the reason the MLS is the best is because how you can dissect the data. Right? You can look inside the other properties, the comps that are on the market, the comps that have sold. You can see. It's like you're in the properties. Can you do that on RealQuest? No. Can you do that on Zillow? No. So it's the best. Number one action step for you is if you want to be able to create your exit strategy first, guess what? First thing you need to do next week is somehow get access. If you can't find a realtor that is willing to give you your passcodes or do something like that, don't tell take that off the tape, right? I don't know if that's but you understand, right? If not, become a realtor. That's why I became a realtor, because I realized I can't send a list of five properties to my realtor every time I have to analyze a deal. In order to get one deal, you're gonna to have to analyze about thirty. So you gotta get access now. You can't send pretty soon your realtor is gonna get annoyed. And then and then you're gonna to have to find a new realtor and you're gonna be slow. So in order to be quick, you just it's one action step. Now, there's more to it than that. Another thing you could do is take an appraisal class. Very valuable. I went and took an appraisal class, the most boring thing I ever did, but I learned an enormous amount of, about how to appraise properties properly, because that's where all the risk is. So, great action step. I like that. You wrote it down. Hopefully we refine it a little bit more. Give them a round of applause for sharing. All right, how quickly are you going to put it into motion? Well, let me just give you a little bit about how I transition in the business. Just a quick background on myself. You know, obviously, I told you I played in the NFL. I opened a restaurant. The restaurant was a disaster. It was a disaster for me. You know, at the time, I was 23 years old, and I said, oh, I'm going to open this restaurant. I'm going to open this restaurant. I got my money. I had saved 120000 after taxes. My first year playing in the NFL, it's a lot of money, making $250,000 a year as a 23-year-old kid. Anybody have kids in, the, in their early 20s, right? If you gave them $250,000 and they don't have any knowledge or any systems, do you think that money's going to stay long? No. Okay, so I said, all right, I'm going to open a business. And I did. Best and worst thing that I ever did. Worst thing because I almost lost my fortune that I had saved that first year. But the best thing because even though that was a failure, I was taught what not to do. And I didn't look at it as a failure. 
You will fail. Everyone put your hand on your heart right now and say, I will fail. Ah, oh, come on. Here we go. Put your hand on your heart. I know this is cheesy. I will fail. And I'll accept it. You want to know why? Because every successful entrepreneur out there has failed. Many times. Many times. You know, there, there's been books. I, I'm trying to remember the, the book, uh, Failing Forward. Anybody read that book or heard of that book? Excellent book. Excellent book. I read it a few years ago. It's all about how the most successful entrepreneurs, how many times they failed. And it's amazing the stupid blunders they made, but because they weren't afraid to take a risk and take a chance. You know, we've done deals. At the end of the deal, I said, that was stupid. But you know what? The next time, we won't make that mistake. The person who never takes that risk never learns that lesson. And they continue to be in that same pattern. So, how did I get into this business? Well, I was in the restaurant business, figured out that was not a fun business, figured out that was a tough business, figured out I didn't like that business, so I started looking into real estate, because guess what? It seemed more appealing. And it was. We did our first deal, made 52 grand when we flipped it, bought a couple rentals before that, figured out that was the wrong way, flipped our first two deals, made 52 grand, and I called back. I had an offer on my restaurant, an offer on my restaurant at 20 grand. I had invested 80. So how much of a loss was I going to take? 60 grand. I rejected that offer about three weeks prior to that deal being, those two deals being flipped. Who's the first person I called back? I took that offer, 20 grand. I said, I'll take it, because I realized how easy it is to make 52 grand. So I made 52, but I lost 60. Best move I ever made, because I got out of the wrong business into the right business, and now I still drive by that restaurant. I still see the gentleman working there, and he's done a good job. But I think, man, Whew, glad it's him. <laughs> glad it's him, right? It's true. Anybody ever been in the restaurant business or worked in a restaurant? Watch this. Okay, only, only three people have worked in a restaurant. How many loved it, right? Uh, it's not very fun. Not very fun. All right, long hours. Transitioning into the business. Well, how do we transition? Well, I started flipping. That's when the whole business took off. These are the first three deals. This is the first rehab deal that we did. Small little rehab. Took us over 200 hours. I said, we got to shrink this time and make a system. Well, let's go through the steps. How many steps do we got? Six. How many? Six. Wake it up, Robert. How many do we got? Six. Six. How many of you want me to make Robert Captain Excitement over here? Anybody? Yeah. All right, Robert. Everyone say hi, Robert. Hi. You're now Captain Excitement. Whenever I say, are we, and whenever I see the crowd start to die a little bit or get a little sleepy because they stayed out too late last night at the wholesaler's ball, I'll say, Robert, are we excited? And you got to say, I'm excited. I'm excited. All right, good. Yeah. We're just practicing a little bit. All right, six steps. Here's what we do. I break it down into six because why? Are there more steps? You better believe there are, but I got three hours, so I broke it down into six. So that's what I did. Six steps to building wealth. Well, here's how the business works. Obviously, market. Then you've got to go out there and evaluate the leads. Then you've got to go out there and negotiate structure offers. Then you've got to go out there and find buyers, right? Most investors, what they do is this. They cut the circle short. And they continually do the same thing over and over again. And that's why they never get past an income level buying and selling houses of maybe 250, 300, 400,000. Most investors don't get past that level. The reason is they don't have a, a clear-cut system and a team that they can leverage. There's things that you can leverage. You can leverage technology. Can you leverage technology to make your life easier? Yeah. yeah. You get access to the MLS, you have made your life easier. You could probably, just by having access, do at least four to five more deals this year. Not even joking. you. Because you've cut down on the wasted, inefficient time. If a deal lasts, the average great deal, we're talking about a, a deal where you can make 80 grand on, 100 grand. If the average great deal lasts 24 to 48 hours and you need to rely on your realtor and your realtor's on vacation and they get you comps, but no, Pat over here, Pat's got access to the MLS. Pat can evaluate the deal in the same amount of time that, you're, that takes you two days, he can do it in 15 minutes. You're going to lose that deal. You'll lose that deal because it's not as efficient, because the system was lacking, and eventually I want to show you how to build a team. And so that's really where we want to go. So where do we start? What's the most important area of the business? Marketing. marketing. We are all marketers. You are a marketer. It's the most important area. Here's how I think. 40% of your time, your first year in the business, should be spent understanding marketing. 40%. 40%. I'm telling you, when you get a good deal, you will figure out a land trust. I guarantee it, because you're going to have a fire burning under your ass. Because this deal is going to go away 
most people, this is what I was talking about last night, most students of mine who, are, who struggle or who are slow, it's because they ask too many questions. They're trying to solve how to do a double closing before they've solved how to even get a deal. I said, don't try to solve everything. You will not solve everything. Get a good general education and then start marketing because you will figure out how to do it. And the reason I realize this is I get students who call me who I know know nothing, nothing, yet they have a deal on the line, and it's a good deal. We go through the numbers, and they get it done. Along the way, they learn five times as much as, than they did in any seminar. But you have to get your education in a seminar. But pretty soon, you just have to start marketing and realize you're not going to know everything. You're not going to know everything. I don't know everything. I realize I probably know one one hundredth of what there is to probably know about real estate investing. There's so much to know, and I'll never know it all. You never will. You just got to go out there and start doing it. So what do we do? We start with marketing. So let's talk about a system to generate leads. A system to what? Generate leads. All right, we're awake. A system to generate leads. I don't want to show you how to find one wholesale deal. I want to show you how to get leads, you know, 200 leads a month. I want to show you how to start out getting 30 leads a month if you don't get any leads right now. Then the next month, here's a good, good little statement, a, a hard lesson that I learned the hard way. You want to grow your business and get no more. This is what I think. This is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I don't think you can increase the number of calls that you get each month by more than 10 a month. So I think when you start, your goal for the first month should be around 20 phone calls. 20 phone calls, you know, depending on how much time. But each month after that, you should try to increase it by about a factor of 10. Because we increased it by a factor of about 60, and one month we wasted a lot of money on marketing, and we were just overrun with leads and information, and we were inefficient. So each month, your goal for a marketer should be to make your system a little bit better so you can get 10 more leads each month. 10 more leads. Same thing with buyers. Start out with getting 10, then try to get 20, then try to get 30, and build it. It is a, You want to build your buyer's list and find motivated sellers at the same time. Most people say, just get a lead first. No, do both, same time. Build your business from the back end at the same time as you build it from the front end. So let's talk about this system. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Are we excited? Yeah. yeah. Robert? Oh, this is nice. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Just testing you. I know, he's busy writing. All right, so let's talk about what I do really to find motivated sellers is I break it up into five concepts, teaching points. So first thing that you want to do is you want to target your market by finding lists. By what? Finding, finding lists. I think it's the most effective way. The most effective way, the best use of your money when you're starting out is to find a good list and go after it. And then outsource that campaign. So if you say, you know what, I'm going to go after foreclosures. Right? It's very logical here in Florida to do that because the list is easy to get. Right? Foreclosures daily. Who's another list provider? Dan, I know there's a couple for foreclosures. Yeah, there's probably like three or four. Right? Great easy list to get. Now, if the list is easy to get, does everybody have access to it? Yeah. So there's going to be more competition. Right? Probates are a little bit harder to get. In fact, in my area, there's no list provider that puts probates together. So you know what? Nobody markets to it. Nobody. I swear, I've been down to the courthouse myself. I send people down to put this list together. And there's never anybody else marketing to it. It's great. It's a better list if there's no one marketing to it. So some of the lists that you may be going after, and there are opportunities out there I guarantee that you're missing. I guarantee you're missing. How many of you are currently marketing to fire damage properties right now? How many? Nobody. Nobody. We bought 12 last year, 12 fire damage properties. It's kind of become our little niche. Why? Because we, we have access to a list and we market to it. And it's great. Are these people motivated? Not every single person, but yeah. What happens is they get an insurance check, you know, the, the fire happens on a rental, especially if it's a rental, or their own occupied house. They want nothing to do with it. They want to, they want to battle it out and get their insurance check. It takes a couple months. And then they just want to get rid of the property, right? Great short sale deals. If you ever get a property that's over leverage or anything, and a fire happens, it's like home run. The more work the property needs, the easier it is to short sale. I think you should be selective about your short sales when you're a good marketer. You know, and that's what we do. We, we just cherry pick the ones we want to go after. 
right? So there's a lot of lists. I'll give you an idea. Here's all of the different lists that we go after. Now, we do not do this every single week. Some of these lists, out-of-state owners, we hit once a quarter. Some of the email campaigns, the bankruptcy attorneys, some of the email campaigns, the realtors, the top mortgage brokers, right? Some of these things that we do, we don't do them every single week. Some of them we do. Pre-foreclosures we do. We do probates every single week. We do bankruptcies. So what we do is we find these lists and then we target. Now, do you guys want to know where a lot of investors struggle, yes or no? Yes. It's finding those lists. Yes. That's where they struggle. For example, when I started, and is anybody from Connecticut? What's your name again, ma'am? Tyre. Tyre, who else? It's Pat. Pat was Pat from Connecticut. When I started in the business, I didn't know how to find this pre-foreclosure list. It took me about two and a half weeks to really put together a system to put it together. And it was difficult. And that's where most investors struggle is trying to actually figure out how to get these lists. Because you don't, do you have enough money to market to the whole population? No, you don't. You don't have enough money. So what you got to do is you got to target and find the list of where all the motivated sellers live. Where do they live? They live in the data. And there's data that's out there. That's where they live. You know, and for example, has anybody ever told you to go out there and start driving for dollars? You know, Ron LeGrand loves to tell this. Ron LeGrand's as old school as old school gets. I don't even know if he knows how to turn on a computer, even though he's a brilliant internet marketer. It's interesting, right? He's got a good team. But, he, you know, he tells you to go out there and drive for dollars. So what did I do? I went to a Ron LeGrand seminar, and I said, I'm going to drive for dollars. I'm gonna, I knew there was a lot of vacant property, so there I was, drive around like a madman, Finally, I realize I'm wasting a lot of time doing this, a lot of gas. I could probably hire an intern to put this list together. So then I had an intern on the job, and pretty soon we had a couple hundred properties on this list. Then we probably had, I don't know, somewhere around $1,200 committed to building this list because I didn't know how to find it. Then I went down to the New Haven City building department, and I found the same list three times as big, and I asked for it. I got it for free. Right? Is that a kick in the pants? Yeah. Kick in the pants, right? Well, that's because you have the knowledge of how to find the list. Sometimes working harder, guess what? All you get is more hard work. It's about working smarter and more efficiently, finding access to these lists. You know, so those, these are the things that we do. You know, we have boot camps, we have seminars we put on. That's exactly what we go through is how to get that information. Because that's where a lot of investors struggle is they never figure out how to get their hands on the actual list, or if they do get the list, it's incomplete. It has the name of the homeowner, but it's got no property address. Or you got the property address, but now you got to find the homeowner. So that's the little secret to being an effective marketer. First, you got to have accurate data. You got to have what? Accurate data. You have to. You have to be a data whore. You have to gather, that's probably the wrong word to use in the seminar, but you have to gather the data and put it together. I always say at least three or four things that are politically incorrect. So just Preston was probably 10 times as much. Uh, I, I thought I was overdressed yesterday. I mean, I thought I was underdressed yesterday coming in. Uh, I, was wearing, I was wearing a sweater. And I thought, man, I might be underdressed for a seminar. And then I saw press, and I said, whew, I feel good now. <laughs> I'm good. I'm just gonna wear a, I'm just gonna wear a tank top tomorrow. I'll be all right. <laughs> so, all right. What's the best opportunity in 2008? Let's go through how we market the foreclosures, because I think there's a true opportunity. Probates are my best deals. We'll go through those a little bit later. Bankruptcies are great. Fire damage properties are great. Divorce lists are great. If you can get your hands on it, some counties you can't get your hands on it because they protect the information. Every, every city town hall is different. Who is from Pennsylvania? Arnie, right? Some of the lists, guess what? There's going to be no list provider out in Bumblebuck where you live, right? There's no list provider. That's a great thing. You know, in some areas, the list provider, guess what? When, when there's a barrier to entry, that's an opportunity. Don't say that's not because it, it is. I would rather have no list providers in Connecticut because we have a system to gather list. Then all of a sudden a pre-foreclosure list provider popped up and then everybody had the list. So first when I started in the business, there, was, there would literally be two to three letters at the house for pre-foreclosure. Then the list provider popped up and now there's 30, right? Does that happen in Tampa, Dan? How many letters do you think the average homeowner in Tampa gets? A stack, right? How do you distinguish yourself? effective marketing and being different, being more consistent, not just sending one postcard, not just sending a postcard, maybe doing something different. Maybe you have a system where somebody gets the list, 
You have, you print out a packet of information, and you actually have someone go door to door and drop it off. You know? Maybe that's a more effective way. Well, if they're there, they might as well door knock and try to create a warm lead for you, you know, or yourself. If you really want to get a deal fast, go door knock. And then you'll figure out, sometimes you'll get some great deals, but it's not very fun. Anybody ever door knock before? How much fun did you have door knocking? Not much, huh? Yeah. First time I door knocked, I went up to the door, and this is how loud I knocked. <laughs> Anybody? Oh, God. At least I could tell my business partner I was out there door knocking today. <laughs> right? And then by the end of the, by, and then the, the, the second home, it was a little bit louder. Then, literally, within a week, I had to change my whole mindset. I was like, I know you're in there. I'm looking in the windows, right? Because I so you get over it, and it started producing deals. And then I said, you know what? I can create a system. Have somebody else to create some warm leads for me. So now what we have is we have a team of guys that go out the door knock, and they produce leads for us, right? That's another way to get foreclosures. So what I'm going to talk about is how do we market to one list, but how do we do it from multiple angles? And I want you to think about this for a second. Wherever you're from. Think about who's the top realtor in the area. Does, not, does somebody have a person? Who's got a person in their mind who is the top realtor? And it can't be yourself either if you're a realtor. But who's the person that pops up in your mind? Does somebody have a name? Just raise your hand. Yeah, what, what's the name? Christina Griffin. Christina Griffin. Where are you from? Tampa. Tampa. Does anybody else know Christina Griffin? Anybody else? Christina you, you do. Right? Marketing. Why? In fact, some areas you go into, I, I put on like a, a local seminar in Baltimore, and there was this one guy that they mentioned, and everybody knew him. The reason you know that person, generally more often than not, 99% of the time, is marketing. They're the best marketer. That's why you know them. So what do you do as an investor? You become the best marketer. So that when somebody thinks to sell their house, a lot of people don't even know you can sell your house to an investor. So they, what they think is, okay, I can sell for sale by owner, I'll call a realtor. But if you're an effective marketer, they'll start to think, well, I can call that one company. I see their signs. I've gotten some letters from them. I saw a TV ad. Right? Then they start calling you. And you'll know you're getting effective with your marketing when you ask them how they saw you and they can't really remember. And they say, well, I think I got a letter, but then I saw a sign. You know, then I did this. That's when you become effective. So how do you do that? Well, you've got to have a system. If you only got five hours a week, guess what? Working, fulfilling a direct mail campaign, you might be able to get one campaign out a week, and that's the only marketing you'll ever get to unless you have a system and you outsource it. So let's go through the best opportunity in 2008, foreclosures. Let's talk a little bit about this. This was provided, this little slide was provided by a friend of mine. He gave me this slide because it's a great slide about explaining the foreclosure process. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain it. Now every state, do they have a different foreclosure process, yes or no? Yes. Do you guys want to learn this, yes or no? Yes. Okay, all right, just making sure. All right, here's what happens in a foreclosure. And I love to teach on it because I'm going to show you how during this process you can attack. What are we going to do with our marketing? Attack. What are we going to do? Attack. attack. That's what you do. This is a process that a homeowner is going to go through. The foreclosure process. What you do is you can hit them at different stages with your marketing. So, 30, 60, 90 day period. This is before it's public record. This means the general public does not know about it because there was not a Liz pendants or a notice of default filed against the property. Right? So who has the information during this period? Mortgage company? Who's not getting paid? You know, or the, the bank who's not getting paid? Who else? Title company? Mm, who's the guy else going to know? Owner? Owner's going to know. I hope the owner knows. Sometimes they don't. Who else is going to know? Credit bureau. Exactly. So where's the, where's the only place you can get the list? Credit bureau. It's the only place. It's a very difficult list to get. It took me about a year and a half to get this list consistently in my area. It's a great list to go after. It's not the best list. It is one of the top three lists to go after. Well, most people don't even know that you can market during this time period. Most people in my area, there's probably two, three people in the whole state. Now, Connecticut's not big. It's only three million people. You know, how big is Tampa? How many people in Tampa in the greater Tampa area? Two million, right? So basically, Connecticut is Tampa, if, if you want to look at it. So, to give you an idea, about two to three people are, are actually consistently going after that list. We, we call that the magic list. <laughs> magic list. No, it's a 30, 60, 90 day list. Right? 
got to go through a mortgage broker who's qualified, been approved by the credit agencies, has had his books or had or her books investigated. So that they're not a predatory lender, they get the list. But this list leaks out, there's list providers. There's one national list provider uh, that I know of. There might be a couple more. But I'll tell you, this list is like gold. But that's not the only area. Well, when I started, I didn't even know that, I wasn't even marketing during that period. So was I losing opportunities? Yeah, because I didn't have access to a list. I was marketing when the list pendants was filed. And in the state of Connecticut, I'm going to explain the state of Connecticut, it's very similar to the state of Florida, about the same length of process. So what happens is the homeowner goes late, 90 to 120 days. Then the bank files the list pendants, and that's when the legal action starts. And so what happens is now it's public record. Now does everybody have access to it? Yeah. Especially if there's a service that puts the list together and then resells it. Right? What does foreclosures daily do? That's exactly what they do. They have a researcher that goes out, their business model is put some data together. Is data valuable? Yeah, oh, immensely valuable. Immensely valuable. And then they sell it. So that's what they do. Well, during this period, you have, depending if you're in Georgia, you have 21 days. Anybody from Georgia? How long is it? Is it 21 or 28? I can't remember. Days. Yeah, so it's under 30 days. I don't know if it's actually 21 or 28 because I don't do Georgia real estate. I don't invest in Georgia, but I know it's very short. Texas is very short. You know, different states is very short. Rhode Island is shorter. Connecticut, it's longer. New York, yeah, I think it lasts five years. I don't know. It's a long time. <laughs> right? And you can work the system. But in the, state of, uh, in the state of Florida, it's about six months more or less. Am I correct? Six months. That's a period you have to hit the homeowner with your marketing. So we're going to do different strategies to do that. Then they have a final judgment, and then they, have, they set an auction date, and they have 30 days to the auction. Then, once the auction happens, if nobody buys it at auction, it becomes an REO. Now, every state's a little different. So don't take this for gold in every single state. You know, and we have different processes. In, in the state of Connecticut, there has to be equity for them to have an auction. Otherwise, they, they call it strict foreclosure, and the bank automatically takes the house back. Most investors think this is how you buy foreclosures, through REOs. When the, when the bank owns it, and they list it with an agent, and every other investor in America sees it, you know, this is when realty, any, any consultant for realty track in here, or anything, but realty track, you know, they're this national foreclosure service provider, then they sell the data, which, you know, the data sucks, right? Because uh, list providers, they got to be local. Those are the best list providers. So, REO, this is where I thought I got the properties. And then I thought, well, I'm going to be a little smarter. I'm going to start going to auctions. So I started going to auctions. You have a lot of risk when you go to auctions. Write this down. Auctions are awesome, not for buying properties, but fi for finding who? Buyers. 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 It's crazy. You know what they do? An auction company will spend $5,000 you know, this is for like bulk auctions, to put like 50 to 150 investors in a room. If you're not there, you're crazy. What they've done is they, they've marketed to find all the qualified buyers in your area and they put them in one room. So what do you do? You go there and you gather every business card you can because you don't have to spend five grand to have a qualified buyers list at the end of the, end of the day. And what do you do that? You do that five, six times every time they have an auction. So what do I do? I have a guy every single week that goes out to the auctions. A lot of times we don't even bid. He just gets new buyers and builds out a list. You want to make your life easy? Is that a good idea? Yeah. You guys like that idea? Yeah. Are you guys going to put it into motion? Yeah. What are you going to do? How do you do it? You got, first, you got to find an auction. Then you got to set a date. Then you got to do it continuously. And then what you do is you hire an intern. Can we have an intern? Yeah. Did Kramer from Seinfeld have an intern? <laughs> he had an intern. What the hell did Kramer do? <laughs> right? So get over it. If you've never done a deal, get an intern. You know a lot more than they know just by being at this seminar. You will have no idea that you really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> just send them out to the auction, and now all of a sudden you're leveraging their time. That's what wealthy people do, is they leverage other people's time, and then they start building their list. Right? Great way, Dan. Dan runs a RIA. Great way to put new, fresh people into your RIA. Go to an auction. All of a sudden, you got 150 business cards. Hey, come, come learn about investing. 
right? Just another strategy, multiple strategy. Well, that's a great strategy to find buyers. So I started bidding on properties. We did buy some properties. One out of every 15 auctions, we actually bought a property because we were lucky enough that only three people showed up and finally you'd get a good deal. Most of the time you won't get a good deal from auction. It's too risky. Can't see the property a lot of times. You know, people bid crazy prices. They're, they're, there's your buyers. You'll know exactly how many cents in the dollar they're paying. They're paying 80 cents on the dollar, 75 cents on the dollar, sometimes 90 cents on the dollar. When the market was hot, they were paying 95 cents on the dollar. And this is what I figured out. Hmm, 95 cents on the dollar, 90 cents on the dollar, 85 cents on the dollar. If I can find them at 50 to 60 cents on the dollar, hmm. So what I started to do, I started creating flyers for all my properties, and I'd go to the auctions, and all the attorneys who were putting on the auctions used to get pissed off when I showed up. So I said, don't bid on this property, check this one out. <laughs> check this one out, right? And I was selling properties right there at the auction. Every time they saw me, Fuck, this guy's showing up again. He's not even gonna bid, is he? No, just selling properties. Well, it's because I had started marketing during this period. That's what I want you to understand. Now, this is just foreclosures, just one-fifth of the business. Mike, let's find out the truth. Mike's here. Mike Collins. Let's put Mike on the spot. Mike, why'd you start Rehab List? Uh, my buyer World Peace? World Peace. Did <laughs> 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 we were confused with alcohol we had now. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, all, in all seriousness, why'd you start Rehab List? Uh, I was paying the campers to contribute two or three thousand a month and I needed an easier way to get my you see that? Isn't that what I said? He started because what's your most valuable asset? What's your most valuable asset? Buyer's list, especially in today's market. Right? That was the way he was marketing his properties to a list, building his buyer's list. His buyer's list probably went from this to that's why he has it. Great, smart, brilliant. Right? Only person I've seen in America that has created a service like that that has actually somewhat good deals on there. You know, most of the time you go to a service and you don't see any good deals. So, he was building his buyer's list. Well, that's what we were doing. We are going to auctions, they're spending five grand to put people in a room, and I was there, gathering business cards, building my list, saying, thank you very much, I don't have to market at all. Well, we did have a lot of marketing strategy, because that's not the only strategy. You want to know another great strategy? You want to build your list? How many of you want to build, and at the end of the year, right now, what's, what's the date right now? Are we in the month of January? Okay, do you think it's realistic to say, do you think it's realistic to put a thousand people on your buyer's list by the end of the year? Let me ask you honestly, how many of you have a buyer's list of more than a thousand people? Don't be shy, because there's probably not many. Nobody. One person. Dan, rehab list, right? Right? Thousand people. Is that realistic? How realistic is it? Who's got a strategy to build their list? Shout it out if you got one. Okay, an auction, right? You're going to put, if you go to an auction, you might put ten people on. So every weekend you're going to be adding 10, 15. Some of the bigger auctions you might actually get 50 people, depending on the type of auction. Great way to put qualified people in, because they all got checks, they're all bidding. Wow, it's brilliant, right? I don't, I don't know if there's a more qualified audience in an auction, because a lot of them have at least 10%, you know, depending on the auction terms, and they're going to finance the property and or they're going to close with cash. That's a great way to put qualified buyers. So I used to send interns to every single auction around Connecticut. They used to come back every Saturday. I'd sit back in the office and say, all right, guys, empty your pockets. And they had all the business cards. They had a list. We started feeding them right into our list. And sooner or later, it became very easy to sell properties. Here's a great way. You guys want to build your list to 1,000 in less than six months? Yeah. yeah. All right, here's a, here's a great way. Now, this is not as qualified, but we go to trade shows. Trade shows home shows. You will find retail buyers, you will find investor buyers, you will find jokers all in one place. And you're just going to grab their name, their email, their information and build your list. And when you build it over 5,000, call Mike, I'm sure he'll figure out a way to monetize the list as well. <laughs> right? It's true. But what you want to do is you want to build that list because it becomes easy to sell properties. And you want to do it. So what we used to do is we used to do a little giveaway. We'd, we'd open a booth. we do this at our investment club. Now, Dan doesn't want me to give this idea out, but... Yeah. All right, okay, Dan. They have these trade shows. A lot of RIAs have trade shows, right? So you can basically have about 150 business cards by the time you leave that trade show, right? I've been, I've been to trade shows where we've gathered over 3,000 business cards. From people. Now, is every person serious? No. So you've got to figure out who's serious, who's not. You've got to segment your list. But more importantly, I just want you to get names. 
so that when you send out an email blast, you're not blasting the 10 investors that you know, you're blasting those 10 investors and 150 other people that you met in some way, shape, or form. What is the greater probability of selling a wholesale deal? More people, right? That's the idea. So, how did I get on this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to attack just foreclosures right now, right? This foreclosure is one fifth of the business. Uh, well, there are so many other strategies you can use to find deals, but I'm going to show you what we do with this process. So, what we do now is we have to compel these people. We have to what? Compel. No. Compel. You must be compelling. Who's married in here? Who's married? All right. Are you sitting next to your wife? Yes. Okay. What's your first name? Adam. Adam. What's your name, ma'am? Kimberly. Kimberly and Adam. All right. Everyone give them a round of applause hey. for being married. Kimberly and Adam. Now, Kimberly, let's tell the truth. <laughs> Was Adam a little bit more compelling on, his, on the first date than, say, he is now sitting next to you? Absolutely. Yeah, right? <laughs> and then kind of over the years, he got a little less and less compelling. The second day, you know, the shirt was a little wrinkled and... You know, but it, but it worked, right? Well, you had a compeller with your marketing in some way, shape, or form. Did you have to have a system to follow up? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Believe me, I know you needed a system to follow up, right? So you had to be consistent. You had to be compelling. You know, you had to tell her, you know, you had to tell her what she wanted to hear. You were a nice guy. You like kids. You have kids? Oh, you don't? Okay. You had to tell her things that, that made sense so that you attracted. You had to compel her in some way. Well, I use that as an example because marriage is the same thing as marketing to motivated sellers. What's going to attract a motivated seller who's in foreclosure is completely different than what's going to attract somebody who's recently inherited a property. It's in Tampa. They live in California. They just, Aunt Sally just passed away. Completely different message is going to gear towards them. Now, not only does it have to be compelling, because the compelling message at the wrong time is ineffective, right? Certain messages. If you're pregnant, guess what? Finally, those, those direct mail letters that you've been getting or those little value packs about the, what do they call them, Lamaze classes? Is that what they call them? Uh, or the Lamaze Center? Finally, the message hits you at the right time. Because six months prior, it meant nothing to you. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to marketing for sellers. That's why you have to be continuous. You not only have to be compelling, but you have to be continuous, and you have to hit them at the right time. You know, my probate letters, I don't send out the first day you know, that the filing happened. Why? Because I realize it's just too sensitive of a time period. My foreclosures, bam, right away. You know, and you time them differently, and then you have to be consistent. And the more you show up, the more leads you'll get. The more you show up, the more leads you'll get. So what do we do? Well, guess what? We have all these different series. We have flyers that go out. We have letters that go out. We have postcards. Right when I started in the business, this is what I did. I went to a seminar. Damn these seminars. I went to a seminar, <laughs> and at this seminar, I was given an idea. Here's a little generic postcard, right? It was probably Ron Legrand's passed down through 18 different gurus. Right? Anybody, who has that orange business card with the black writing on it that folds over that says, we buy houses cash? Who's got it? There's someone that's got it in every crowd. Right? This is what we do. We copy. Right? This is what realtors do, and that's why 99% of realtors are horrible marketers. It's because they copy. You want to know the worst marketing for realtors? I love looking at good marketing. Dan Kennedy, write that name down. If you have not studied Dan Kennedy, excellent, excellent guy when it comes to small business marketing. Now, he is not, per se, real estate investing specific. He's not. What he does is he gives you good concepts. So, he's one of the people I learned from. I've learned, but he's not the only person. In fact, Bill Glazer, in my opinion, is a better marketer and, and a better communicator, and they're partners, right? I've learned a lot from him. I've learned a lot from Jay Abraham. I've learned a lot from a lot of different people but what I realized when I started out is that I got an idea. She gave a little postcard, and I copied that postcard. I ran off thousands of them, and I just started sending them out. And I was getting some calls here and there, but it was a waste of money, highly ineffective, and it wasn't continuous enough and had the wrong message. Right? But it did work. You know, if you sent out enough, some calls came in. And I said, well, I want to save money. I want to save time. I want to be more efficient. I've got to change the message towards the list that I'm going after. And I started adapting. You know, and that's really what I teach is these concepts of how to do it. Well, as soon as I started sending out two, it started being more effective. And then I started creating a pattern, right? And I was going after them multiple times throughout the period, right? And this is just one campaign, right? Well, this is, is this the only way to find foreclosures? No. Is this the only way? 
No. Could you door knock? Could you do other things? Well, as soon as I started adding other campaigns, I realized I was more effective. And let me give you an example. I'm going to show you the next campaign. And I'll just give you an idea of how we do different things. When a homeowner is in foreclosure, is it natural for them to try to refinance? A lot of times. Not all the time, but a lot of times. They call the mortgage broker. The mortgage broker tells them they're crazy. And now all of a sudden, the mortgage broker knows about this foreclosure. And the person knows. And they realize they can't refinance. Right? So maybe now the message will be effective because the time period is effective. If you hit them right after that time period, maybe it's known, right? But you don't know when they're going to talk to a mortgage broker. But here's the, the point. Who else knows about the foreclosure now? The mortgage broker. The mortgage broker. So if you have a marketing system to go after the mortgage brokers who aren't buying houses, who aren't doing short sales, could you get more leads? Sure. Yeah. Could you do this via direct mail? Yes or no? How many of you think you could do it via direct mail? Yes. Right? Okay. You want a more inexpensive way to do it? Could you do it via email? Yeah. So you start putting together a list, or you buy a list of mortgage brokers in your area, and you send out a campaign. Now, are you going to market to them differently? Can you send out the generic Ron LeGrand postcard to the mortgage broker? You know what the mortgage broker is going to do? What the hell is this? All right. There goes 25 cents. There goes 40, 50 cents. No, you, what attracts them is completely different. What attracts them? Business. So you have to have a message that's geared to them that says, here's how I can help you. Here's what I can do that's different. Here, if you have this scenario, here's how you're going to monetize the scenario. What do the mortgage brokers want to know? How the money's going to come into the pocket. And so you have to communicate that in your marketing in a way that gets them to call you to say, hey, tell, I just got this email from you. Give me a little bit more about what you do. Okay, here's what we do. And you work it out. Now, is every mortgage broker going to respond to you? No, no, they're not. They're not. Well, what we did is I realized that. I said, I not only want to influence, let's say Arnie's in foreclosure. Arnie, I need you to look like you're in foreclosure. All right. Uh, Arnie, you're doing a pretty piss poor job. That's all right. <laughs> right, Arnie, you're in foreclosure. I market to you, and even though I'm continuous, you don't respond to me. Right? Most people don't respond to your message until at least six or seven different times they've seen it. Could be different ways. So if you're sending one postcard, are you going to be effective? No. Just, just write it off. No, you're not. So now Arnie, what's your name, sir? Oh, Paul. Arnie, Paul is a mortgage broker that Arnie knows. Now, Arnie contacts Paul. Paul says, you're not in foreclosure, but I've formed a relationship with Paul. And all of a sudden, Paul says, well, you should call Fan Merrill over at CT Homes. He's actually a business associate of mine. He works with, oh, you know what? I've been getting letters from him. Now all of a sudden, the connection's made. Boom, the lead comes in. The lead comes in either from Paul or from Arnie. Well, what you try to do with just foreclosures is that in many different ways. Are they influenced by other people? Do they talk to, sometimes do they talk to bankruptcy attorneys? Do they sometimes talk to realtors, right? Well, what I did is I found the top 50 realtors in my area, and I said, I'm going to do direct mail to the top 50 realtors, letting them know what I do, so they can send me short sales, mostly, because most of them are going to be short sales. Some, you know, some realtors will feed you equity deals, but not very many. They're going to feed themselves, they're going to feed someone in their office, but they'll, they'll feed you short sale deals all day long. Well, I said, I'm going to take the top 50 and I'm going to go after the top 50 via direct mail, the rest of them I'm going to go after via email. So we found a list, we sent out campaigns to them, right? Do you have over leveraged clients who can't help? It explains exactly how we work to do that. Now what else do we do? We send out email campaigns to them. And we're continuous. Why? What was the, what was the realtor's name, ma'am? Uh, that, that's in your area, something Griffin? Christina Griffin, do you think she has effective marketing campaigns that are continuous? <laughs> What's that? I can't see you. There's a plant. <laughs> do you think she has effective marketing campaigns that are continuous? Right? This is what you want to do. Now, this is just on the front end. We haven't even gotten to the back end. This is just on the front end. So, what we do is we start attacking. What do we do? Yeah. All right, let me show you what we do with our marketing now. Now, with foreclosures, I was sending out one letter campaign when I started. Then, I said, you know what? I got my hands on that list. So, I started marketing during that period. Then, when the foreclosure was filed, that's when I switched to my other direct mail campaign. Right? So I had different campaigns depending on what time the period they're at. The messages that compelled them were different. They were similar because it's still foreclosure, but guess what? This one mentioned more of an urgency. 
you know, because it's getting later in the process. The later on it gets, the more urgent the letters get, the more urgent the postcards get, the more you have to speak to them. Now, with, did you think we stop there? How many of you think we stop right there? How many think it keeps going? It keeps going, right? Here's something that you can do that's very effective. If you don't want to door knock yourself, just hire somebody, eight bucks an hour, grab the list of 100 foreclosures, create a packet, and just create a door packet delivery system. This is not a scientific name for it. There's no name for it. I just created that name. What they do is they get a packet of information that's more professional, better than their direct mail piece. It has your information, and they go out and they drop it off on every single door. Do you think that's going to get a better resp response rate than direct mail? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, why? Different. It's different form of delivery, alternative form of delivery. So everyone else is sending 30 letters, you're sending letters and dropping packets. Do you think you're going to get more calls? Yeah. Most direct mail, write this down, if you're good at direct mail, you beat 1%. Any guru who tells you they get a 10% response rate from a direct mail letter, what do you think they're doing? They're selling you a course because they're full of crap. Nobody, if you get 10%, uh, this business would be easy. It would be easy. 10%, I heard this the other day, I'm not going to say who, I was, I was like, you're kidding me. They are not saying, I said, if anybody who knew anything about direct mail was sitting in that audience, they'd know they were full of crap. 10%, yeah, right. You know what? National companies who do direct mail by the millions, they try to beat 1%. You think they know something about direct mail? Sure, yeah. I will tell you, if you're in a different area where there's not a lot of investors and you send out a yellow letter campaign, you will beat 1% pretty consistently. You might be 3 4%, 5%. You may get that high in certain areas. The more investors, do you think your response rates are going to shrink? So what do you got to do? You got to be different. You got to be what? Different. different. So how do we be different? Well, we could have people dropping off packets. We could have people doing things that are different. So what do we do? We also, I said, now that they're dropping off packets and I got this system down, the list comes in, I have someone, now this is, I started doing this. I was going out there door knocking. I was printing up the list, mapping it out, and trying to make it as effective as possible, and I drive out and I could door knock on 20 doors at a time. Pretty soon I got sick and tired of doing that, even though we were making money. And I said, I gotta have someone just deliver packets and do that. Because I realize every time, who's ever been door knocking, anybody? How many, is, how many of you have done more than 50 doors? More than, how many people are home on average? Um, maybe 20, 25%. That's good. I know you've done the business. Whenever, it, those are the stats. It's usually a little bit less. One out of every, I'd say one out of every five to Depends six. Depends on when you go. Yeah, it does depend on when you go. One out of every six. But if you left something at the door, so I started leaving at the door, and I said, you know what? I can reach more people if I just leverage and had other people do this. So I cut people in. I said 15% of any deal that we wholesale, 15%. If we rehab the deal, write this down. This is good information because guess what? When I started out, I gave 5% and it never worked out. I get 15% of any wholesale deal for my door knockers. 15% is a lot. It's the only thing that keeps them around because most of them are going to drop out anyway. 15% of any deal that they generate, that they bring in, and all they have to do is literally handle the first few objections that they get at the door and then get me an appointment. And a lot of times they just hand their cell phone straight to the seller, say, talk to my boss, and it's either someone, myself, or somebody in my office that creates an appointment. That's all they have to do. And guess what? You can pay them very little. Some people, you don't have to pay at all. 15% is enough to motivate them. So we were doing that. That's one way. But do you think we stop there, yes or no? What are we going to do with our marketing? Attack. What are we going to do? Attack. All right. We got one person that's wanting to attack over here in the front. So here's a great way. This idea came from a student. They said, take all the phone numbers that you can find. Obviously, you've got to bounce against the do not call. Uh, who does telesales in here? There's someone, well, oh, he's not in here for, for rehab list. There, oh, what's a, there's a website that, that you can do the do not call. Is it like do not call org or something like that, dot org, dot gov? Is that what it is? That's right. So there's a website you can find out who you shouldn't be calling. But you can do a voice blast. And for example, we used to do cold calling campaigns. And we would call people, and we were generating leads. But now what we do is, we, I said, you know, that takes too much time. I had people that weren't good at it. I had some deals we converted. Now you can do a voice blast. Protus, write this down. www.protus, P-R-O-2, uh, P-R-O-2, I can't even spell, T-U-S. 
<laughs> hanging out with, hanging out too late at night at the wholesaler's ball. I can't, I can't pronounce protus. Protus. <laughs> All right, that's a service where you can record a message that blasts, and you can blast a hundred people in a matter of one second. They'll all go out. Not one second. It's probably about one minute. All the calls will be distributed. And all of a sudden, you might get one, two phone calls back. But if you do that consistently, that's all it takes. And it's so much better than cold calling or doing anything else. And the, and the message is very compelling. Hey, here's what we do. Here's how we can help you. Blast it out. Now, if you're doing these four campaigns, do you think you're better off? And are, Arnie, are you going to get more leads than Paul, who's just doing one postcard from Ron LeGrand? Right? Yeah, probably get more leads. You better believe you're going to get more leads because you're more consistent. Well, that's not where it's... It keeps going. It just keeps going. Right? Mortgage brokers, realtors, bankruptcy attorneys, real estate agents who do pocket listings. Those are all the different ways that you can market to people that are just in foreclosure. And as a result, you know, this is why I talk with a lot of gurus. I talk with a lot of gurus and they do say, Than, the one thing that your students do well is they find deals. They find deals. And they know how to find sellers and buyers. And that's because we have different ways to go out there. Now, this is just foreclosures. And I'll give you an example. Here's a house. Here's a house that came right off these campaigns that we did. There's a little house we flipped, a little thing like that. We made 60 grand on that little rehab. And it was off a short sale that we did through a referral from a realtor. I told the realtor, get realistic. You're not going to make any money trying to list this property. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to work the deal. Negotiated, short sale that deal. It's great profit. That's the end result. But what's the end result for you? Obviously, the income. How many of you want to make more money in the year 2008? Be honest with me. Are we all here for that same goal? Good. So do I. That's why I want to learn something, too. I'm going to write some notes down. People have ideas. This idea, that was given to me by a student. So they want you to do all this cold calling. Just do a voice fly. Oh, jeez. Never thought of that. You want to know another great strategy? This is awesome. Are you guys want to know another great strategy, yes or no? Yeah. All right. Kimberly, do you want to know another great strategy? Yeah. All right, come on. I'm going to just tell just you. All right, here's what we got. All right, here's how it works. Bandit signs, right? Are they illegal in most towns? Yeah, right? Are they still out in every town? Yeah. yeah. Then there's this guy who came up with this internet bandit signs, right? Drive. Great, great strategy. But I got, a, I got a great strategy for it. Great strategy for it. I said, in my town, they were beating me down for the signs. The sign police had my direct connection to my cell phone. I don't know how they got it, but they, somehow they found me. So I said, I got I to gotta figure out a better way to do this. Now, it's a little bit more of an advanced concept. I think it's probably a concept you want to do after you've done your first deal or two and you have some money in the bank. <clears throat> but what you can do is, have you ever seen those street boxes that have the realtor magazines? Yeah. Right? The realtor magazines are in these street boxes. Well, I bought 